This is part two of the video lecture on business ethics. This video lecture is for the church, society, and ethical issues in Asia course at the East Asia School of Theology. And my name is Derek Atkins. So in the first part of this video lecture, we, we ask the question, why is business ethics important? We also look at some biblical teachings that undergird business ethics. Now, we are going to look at um, some foundational um, principles that can guide us as we navigate business ethics. And after we look at these foundational convictions, we will then move on to look at a number of specific ethical issues. So let's look at some foundational, let's look at some foundational convictions that can guide us in our business ethics. The first conviction I want to mention is that God is Lord over all of creation, which includes human activities. I have here a quote from the Dutch theologian, Abraham Piper, who said, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. And what this tells us is that God really is the Lord over all of creation. And this includes all of human activities, and that in turn includes all of our business activities. Here's a second foundational conviction with regard to business ethics. And that is God gives each one of us different gifts and abilities. And he calls us to use these gifts and abilities, including those gifts and abilities that can be used in the business world. So he's given us different gifts and abilities, and he calls us to use these gifts and abilities to glorify him, including glorifying him through our work. A third foundational conviction that can, can guide us is this. Because of the fall, human sinfulness has entered the business world corrupting various relationships and practices in a wide variety of ways. And this is a very sad and unfortunate truth, but it is a reality in our fallen world. One example of how sin has corrupted the business world is doctors prescribing certain drugs to patients solely because of a sweetheart deal with a certain drug company. So that would be one example of how sin has corrupted business relationships. And here's a fourth foundational um, conviction that can guide us in business ethics. Because of Christ's redemptive work, Christians in the business world are called to redeem marketplace relationships and marketplace practices in ways that will bless others and lead to human flourishing. And this is part of how we show the world the good news of the gospel, because the good news of the gospel is that Christ has rescued us from our sin, and he is presently at work to continue his work of redeeming us. And so when we um, work in redemptive ways in our businesses, 
and our and our workplaces, we are living out the gospel message, and we are showing the world how God is at work to redeem all of humanity. So these are some foundational uh, convictions that can guide us as we navigate business ethics. Now, I want us to look at a number of definitions that will help us as we discuss business ethics, not only in this uh, video lecture, but also in our class, during our classroom discussion. So the first definition I want to mention is the word stakeholders. Stakeholders are those individuals and entities affected by a business's decision. So here we have a, a, a graphic that illustrates some of uh, the many different relationships that a company might have with others. And all of these different people or organizations or groups that are shown here in this graphic are stakeholders because they are affected by a company, this company's decision. So stakeholders can include clients, customers, suppliers, investors, retailers, employees, the media, government, the environment, the community, and other competitors. All of these are stakeholders. For example, let me give you a, um, a more concrete example of how this plays out. So Starbucks is a company that has stores in countries around the world and its decisions affect literally millions, including its 250,000 plus employees, coffee growers, tea growers, milk producers, government officials, and millions of customers. Now, this picture in the upper left-hand corner is of a council member of the uh, city council in Philadelphia who spoke at this Starbucks after a, um, a white employee at Starbucks called 911 to report a Black customer who was who he or she thought was just loitering in Starbucks without uh, buying any products. And this led Starbucks to change its policies to allow people to come into their stores without needing to buy anything. So this is a, these are all examples of stakeholders who are affected by the decisions that Starbucks makes. Okay, now, another word I want to mention is the word stockholder. Now, stockholders are different from stakeholders because stockholders are those who own shares of the company's stock. Now, a stockholder may also be known as a shareholder. So these people have invested in a company and they, they want to get a return on their investment. So in a sense, each one of these stockholders or shareholders own a piece of this company. The next word I want to mention is the word compliance. Compliance is the extent to which a company conducts its business operations in accordance with applicable regulations, statutes, and laws. So um, corporate uh, compliance officers in a company have the job of making sure that their company is complying or obeying all the laws, regulations, and statutes that apply to their company. Now, I want to add that 
business ethics often goes far above and beyond mere compliance, or at least it should. The next um, phrase I want to introduce to you is that of corporate culture. A corporate culture are those shared beliefs, values, and behaviors that create the internal or organizational context within which managers and employees interact. So um, this simply means um, this a corporate culture are those beliefs, values, and behaviors that affect how people interact within a certain corporation. For example, let me give you a couple of examples of um, corporate culture. I once was a temporary worker at EDS in Dallas. EDS manufactures electronic products. Um, on my first day at work, I was told that when I was in public areas, I was expected to wear a coat and tie. But when I was at my desk, I could take off my coat to be more comfortable and informal. So that's one example of corporate culture, which tells us that EDS is a very um, has a very formal corporate culture, but it does allow some room for informality in certain situations. Now, in the con, um, other businesses may allow employees to be to wear even more casual clothes, such as golf shirts, etc. Now, in the context of corporate of business ethics, corporate culture is important because one needs to consider how a company or business promotes or fails to promote integrity among its employees, because that too is part of corporate culture. The last word I want to mention right now is corporate social responsibility, also um, abbreviated as CSR. This is the practice by which a business views itself within a broader context as a member of society with certain implicit social obligations and environmental responsibility. So a corporation is entitled to make a profit, but it should not only pursue profit. It should also be a good neighbor within the community and seek to improve the lives and welfare of those who are part of the larger community. And so that's what corporate social responsibility is all about. Now that we've looked at some definitions that can help us, let's begin to look at some specific issues. Most Christians have received little to no practical teaching about how to live out their faith in the marketplace. Instead, what most Christians have learned about business is secular. Secular knowledge in and of itself is not necessarily bad, but since secular knowledge is based solely upon human sources, it is at best incomplete. One common approach Christians take toward dealing with ethical challenges in the marketplace is that of compartmentalization, in which Christians live at, with one mindset in their private lives, but behave in a completely different way at work. Over the short term, Christians may find this approach helpful in negotiating the challenges of the business world, but compartmentalization ultimately leads to internal conflict between one's Christian convictions and those worldly values that are opposed to biblical teaching. It is far better for Christians to live with integrity 
in all areas of their lives to live in such a way that honors God not only in their private lives, but also at work. In today's business world, there are many different ethical issues one must deal with. Some ethical issues mainly involve decisions or actions by employers or companies, while others mainly involve decisions or actions by employees. But many ethical issues involve the behaviors of both employers and employees. What follows is a brief introduction to some of today's most pressing ethical issues in the marketplace. So the first issue I want to then talk about is discrimination at the workplace. This is one of the most prominent ethical issues in business today. And while the specific laws and regulations surrounding discrimination and harassment may differ from nation to nation, there is nonetheless a consensus among most government and business leaders that discrimination in businesses is not only wrong, but should be punished. Now, discrimination in the workplace can take, place, can take many different forms. And um, it is not only uh, considered wrong, but it is also now becoming increasingly illegal in many parts of the world. So let's look at some of these different um, categories of discrimination. The first is age. This is discrimination against those who are 40 years old and older, and this is considered wrong. Still, it remains true that many people who lose or quit their job after they are 50 years old often find it quite difficult to find another job. A second form of discrimination at the workplace has to do with disability. In many countries, businesses are required to make reasonable accommodations and provide equal treatment to those who are physically or mentally disabled. Another type of discrimination that may take place at the workplace is has to do with genetic information. Some countries prohibit employers from discriminating against employees based on employees' information gathered from genetic testing. This also includes employees' family history. For example, Genetic information could lead a company to offer lower levels of health insurance coverage for employees whose family have a history of certain genetic, of certain diseases, okay? So that's why genetic discrimination on genetic information can affect real world um, outcomes. Another form of discrimination is that that is based is discrimination that is based on race or ethnicity. Companies must treat all their employees consistently regardless of their race or ethnicity. Related to this is discrimination based on national origin. Companies should not discriminate against employees based on their national origin. This becomes especially important during times when different countries may experience tense relations with each other. Another area where discrimination is um, often prohibited is discrimination based on religion. And in many countries, uh, businesses are required to make reasonable accommodations to allow any employee to freely practice his or her religion. Then there is discrimination based on sex. 
employees should receive equal treatment regardless of their sex. This includes having men and women, giving men and women equal pay for equal work and providing mothers with maternity leave when they give birth to children and not penalizing them for having children. And then there is discrimination based on gender identity. Increasingly, more countries are now prohibiting discrimination based on employees' sexual orientation or gender identity. Given how sensitive this issue has become in recent years, this is an area that many Christians find increasingly challenging to navigate because as Christians, we believe that that kind of behavior and that kind of lifestyle is wrong and even sinful. So we have, it, it's, it's becoming increasingly challenging for us to navigate this particular uh, form of potential discrimination. Now, while we often think of discrimination as an issue that only employers are responsible to observe, discrimination should also be avoided by employees themselves. In other words, if you are an employee, you should not engage in discrimination against those who are disabled, those who are of a different race, those who those of the opposite sex, those who are older, etc. Now, another prominent ethical issue is that of harassment. Harassment is, there is some overlap between discrimination and harassment. Um, since 2017, the Me Too movement has exposed sexual harassment, including many prominent men who sexually harass women. So here's the definition of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is any behavior that is characterized by unwelcome or inappropriate sexual remarks or physical advances in the workplace or other professional or social situation. Sexual harassment has historically involved men harassing women, but sexual harassment can also include women harassing men or even same-sex harassment. Harassment can also take place against any of the other categories of discrimination that we mentioned above, such as age, disability, race, ethnicity, national origin, religion, sexual orientation, or gender identity. So, for example, if someone makes an offensive joke about another person's nationality, that would be considered harassment. So um, these, these forms of harassment can take many different forms, including inappropriate jokes about people from any of these categories, hostility towards any of these people because of their particular identity, etc. As believers, we are commanded to love all people regardless of their background. However, we are also commanded to speak the truth in love and to confront sinful behavior when it is appropriate to do so. For example, we should love those who are LGBTQ, but we do not condone their behavior. The next issue I want to talk about is the issue of fair pay. The question of fair pay is a key ethical issue. Employees expect their employers to give them fair pay for their work. There are several elements to the question of fair pay. 
First, there's the question of equality, especially with regard to paying men and women equally. Historically, men have been paid more than women, and even today, women are still paid less than men in many countries around the world, as we can see in this um, graphic on this particular slide. Second, so that's one um, dimension of fair pay. Another dimension of fair pay is the question of the differential in pay between executives and the rest of their companies. In many companies, the president or the chief executive officer, also known as the CEO, receives a salary that is many times greater than the average employee. So this chart illustrates this reality. And the greatest gap between CEOs and average workers is found in the United States where CEOs earn salaries that are on average 265 times the salaries of average employees in their companies. Now, one reason why the pay gap is so wide in the United States is because American CEOs are typically paid with stock options and stocks have historically yielded tremendous profits over the last 50 plus years. Still, there is the question of whether this gap between the pay of CEOs and the rest of their companies is fair. Do CEOs really experience much more pressure and stress than the average employee? How important is their expertise and experience to the company? And are their salaries a fair compensation or are they being paid too much? Another ethical issue relates to workplace health and safety. While this issue does not get nearly as much attention in the news as other ethical issues in business, this is another really important issue because ensuring safe and healthy environment for employees is crucial to the welfare of those who work for the company. Keeping workers healthy and safe is also very beneficial for the company's profitability because workplace accidents are often costly to the company in terms of medical costs for those who are injured, lost productivity, and damages caused to product. Therefore, companies have an ethical responsibility to make sure their workplaces are safe and healthy. This involves compliance with those government regulations that govern safe work practices, but as Christians, we should never be satisfied with mere compliance. Workplace health and safety includes not only having buildings and work sites that are safe, but also providing employees with instructions on safety procedures, avoiding the use of harmful materials whenever possible, providing employees any protective gear they may require at no cost to the employees, and providing adequate work breaks and limits on the number of hours employees work. For example, truck drivers and airline pilots are often limited in the number of hours they are allowed to drive or fly. Employees also have a responsibility to do their part in making and keeping their workplaces safe and healthy. This includes following any safety protocols their supervisors give them, staying focused on their tasks, and not using drugs or alcohol. For example, drug use among workers in the United States is so widespread 
that many small and medium-sized businesses are increasingly turning to the use of robots to prevent workplace accidents caused by workers whose performance is affected by drugs. Another ethical issue is the question of compromising on product quality. One temptation many businesses face is to save money by compromising on product quality. For example, restaurants often have a very thin profit margin. So it's very tempting for them to replace more expensive ingredients with cheaper ingredients. However, doing this will often affect the quality of the food they're selling to their customers. This practice may save money in the short term, but it can have very negative long-term consequences to the company. And so this slide gives another example of how product quality may be compromised. Another way that some companies may compromise on product quality is something called shrinkflation. In shrinkflation, companies will serve smaller portions of the same product while still charging the same price as before. This often happens during times of inflation when many companies are squeezed by rising prices of ingredients or raw material. Once again, this practice may save money in the short term, but it can have very negative long-term consequences if the customers feel they're being cheated. Com compromising product quality not only cheats customers, but can even be harmful to customers, especially if the company sells products that are defective. In extreme cases, defective products can even lead to the deaths of customers. This is why many companies will recall various products, either to repair these products at no cost to their customers or to remove these products from the market altogether. Another um, ethical issue I want to talk, mention now is the issue of diligence. Diligence is a key quality employees should practice. My father was a businessman who hired many secretaries during his career. And one complaint I often heard from him about his secretaries was that many of them simply didn't show up for work on time. Another complaint I often heard from him was that even when his secretaries did show up, many times they would be doing activities other than their job while they were at work. And this was before social media became popular. Now, while it's true that in some jobs, there may be times when very little activity is taking place or the work has, is really boring, employees should still strive to give their best to their work. This is in keeping with the Bible's admonition. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Colossians 3.23. Then there's the issue of employee theft. Another common ethical problem many businesses face is the problem of employee theft. This is a widespread problem. 75% of employees admit to stealing from their employer at least one. Often this takes the form of taking a few pens or other office supplies home, but there are far more serious forms 
of employee theft, including inventory theft. This is when many, uh, many employees steal company products, either for personal use or with the intent of selling these products to gain their own personal profit. There's also, there's also data theft. This is a very troubling form of theft and, in, and can include stealing the credit card information of clients or other employees, stealing an employer's trade secrets or other proprietary information, or stealing customer lists when leaving the company. There's also the theft of services. Many companies offer their employees special discounts, but some employees will misuse these discounts and thereby defraud their companies. There's also payroll theft. An employee whose work involves financial tasks steals and cashes other employees' checks, or they may write fictitious checks and cash them. There is also the theft of cash. This kind of theft often occurs in businesses that handle lots of cash. Employees who steal cash may do so by stealing money from cash registers, safe deposit boxes, etc. They may also steal cash by overcharging customers and pocketing the difference, or by altering accounting records and taking the extra cash. Many employees who steal from their companies may try to justify their theft in various ways, such as I'm simply borrowing some supplies. This won't hurt the company, or it's not fair that I'm paid so little. But whatever the reason, theft is still theft. And not only by, violates the biblical command, you shall not steal, but also almost always violates some law or legal regulation. Depending on how serious the theft is, stealing from one's company could potentially lead to imprisonment, and in some countries may even result in a sentence of death. So this is the end of part two of this video lecture. In part three, we're going to look at some more specific um, ethical issues in, with regard to business ethics, and then we're going to round out our discussion by talking about how Christians can respond to corruption. So please go on to the third video lecture in this series.